Okay. So um, thanks everybody um, for coming to the second of uh, the talks that I'm planning on giving on. Um, uh, essentially a review of the duality web, um, building up towards um, trying to look at the four dimensional duality web. So this would be the second installment of that, and we'll call it the, we'll call it the four dimensional duality web two. Um, and really today I want to focus on um, I want to focus on basically the three dimensional duality web and how we build this up and why we call it a duality web. Um, <clears throat> so to just give you a um, quick rundown, uh, the central question we want to ask um, in, in four dimensions, having motivated the story in three dimensions um, last time is, is there a duality web in uh, four space-time dimensions? Okay, so um, I gave some reasons as to why it was not entirely obvious that there should be a duality web in, in four dimensions. Um, but why there was some hope that there might be a duality web in four dimensions based on some properties of, um, of the three-dimensional web um, and some arguments about um, the, the structure of dualities um, in, in general. Okay, so um, I'm going to follow on what I did last time and try to keep this as pedagogical as possible. There's quite a, quite a wide um, variety of of people in this um, uh, in this talk, and I'm going to um, aim for the average. Um, so I'm going to uh, I'm not going to uh, go too fast. I'm going to try and pace it so that it's accessible to as many people as possible. Please feel free to stop me and ask any questions. Again, this is this is going to be largely a pedagogical review of um, the idea of the three-dimensional duality web. So before we start, um, I want to establish some notation quickly. Um, <clears throat> and the primary thing that we want to talk about here is quantum field theory. So I should tell you about the fields that I'm going to be using. Um, I will typically reserve uh, phi for scalars, and scalars will be the will be the general bosons that I'm going to be working with. Um, Greek letters like psi will be for fermions. Um, capital um, letters like A and B um, will refer to one forms, in a particular gauge one form. So these will be external or non-dynamical gauge fields. So the way to think about this physically is as corresponding to something like um, let's say a condensed matter theorist would take this um, system that we're studying and put it in an external magnetic field. So it's something that you turn on, but we don't consider fluctuations of this field. So this is an external gauge field. And this is to be contrasted with lowercase um, Latin letters like A and B. And this will also have a one form structure. So I will write it like this. But these will correspond to dynamical or fluctuating gauge fields. By which I mean that I will typically have a, a kinetic term um, for such gauge fields. Um, the kinetic terms typically that we consider um, for uh, gauge fields would be Yang Mills terms or Maxwell like terms because everything that I'm going to be talking about here is, is about um, abelian things. We're really talking about um, um, Maxwell type, uh, uh, Maxwell -type um, uh, kinetic terms. So in terms of the actions that we're going to be looking at, um, there's a mass of scalar Let's write this down here. So a massive um, scalar will have an action that looks like this. Um, 
and it will be a functional typically of a gauge field um, A and the scale of phi. And because we're focusing on three dimensions, this is a three dimensional integral, um, which will be mod D A phi squared minus M squared mod phi squared. And just to be clear, this D here is a gauge covariant derivative. The A is not an index. Um, it's really referring to the fact that I'm coupling to um, the gauge field A. So I'm gonna use it as a label um, for the gauge field that I'm gonna to couple to. M is as usual a mass term. Um, and sometimes I'm going to need to add to this a term that looks like lambda mod phi to the four. So I'm gonna to have to, I'm going to sometimes add some phi to the four um, uh, operator to this, um, to, the, to the action. Um, but in general, when I write a scalar action, it will have these terms um, involved in it. Okay. The next thing that we're going to need to talk about is a, um, is a massive or gapped fermion. The gapped fermion is the terminology that we inherit from the condensed matter community. Um, and this will be um, a gapped fermion coupled to a U1 external gauge field. Let's call it A, and the action for this would be um, a functional of psi, the fermion, as well as the external gauge field. And that would be the integral d3x i psi bar, and then a typical Dirac operator, d slash plus m, acting on psi, where the d slash here is gamma mu d mu plus um, or gamma mu d mu minus i a mu, or similarly to what we had in the scalar case, d slash minus i a slash, where the slash notation is the Feynman notation. So those are the actions that we'll be working with. <clears throat> now, the physics underpinning the idea of interchanging bosons with fermions is the idea of um, what's called flux attachment. And this is the statement that if I take a fermion and I attach one quantum of flux to this fermion, then I convert it into a boson and vice versa with bosons. Uh, uh, Jeff, I have a stupid question. So what, what does gap mean here? A gap means um, if, I, if I quantize this fermion and I, and I solve for its um, energy spectrum, there's a gap between the ground state and the next um, excited state. Okay. 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 Um, an equivalent way of stating this is that uh, it's a massive fermion. Got it. Okay. So now I need to tell you about the idea of flux attachment. So flux attachment. Um, says that if I start off with a fermion plus one quantum of flux, like a magnetic flux, this transmutes that fermion into a boson. And the same with a boson plus flux transmutes into a fermion. Okay, so the idea of flux attachment is really a non-relativistic um, idea. And we're gonna be interested in relativistic field theories. And so it's worth asking, how do you do this in a relativistic field theory? Well, in a relativistic field theory, we accomplish the idea of flux attachment by um, adding to the actions that we just spoke about, 
um, a churn Simons term. So the churn Simons term does precisely this. It, it implements um, flux attachment. So I should tell you then about um, these kinds of actions um, like the churn Simons. And John Simon's term will be a, an action that looks like this. It's, it's, um, it's a function of the gauge field again, and it's proportional to, it's proportional to the integral of A um, Can you still see my screen? Uh, no, it's paused. Oh, yeah, it's paused. Uh, the last part is not visible. Sorry, let's try that again. I seem to have exited Zoom for some reason. Um, let me try that again. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure what happened, but I seem to have got kicked out of, out of Zoom. Let me try starting it up again. Um, give me a second. You can just uh, share your um, iPad, right? I mean, directly from, you don't have, need a separately uh, login. Yeah. <sighs> With the um, changed operating system, that functionality seems to have gotten lost. Oh. Um, so I, I've tried that recently and it didn't work. So let me just try and see. I, I had the same problem. For some reason, I could not connect it to uh, connect the uh, through wireless. Uh, so I had to, I basically bought a cable <laughs> and now it works. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me try sharing with cable actually. Let's see if it works. It didn't work the last time, but this is clearly not working now. So, uh, okay. and now let's go share screen and share the iPad. Yeah, the iPad's not seeing this for some reason. Mm. Uh, it is not seeing my iPad. No, it's it, it's it's saying that uh, you're screen sharing, but it's not showing anything. Just uh, just yeah. Apart. Okay, so let, let's try joining again. Okay. I see it's work. It's at least two sixty. Okay. okay. All right, I seem to have joined again. So let's start screen sharing. Okay, seem to be back. All right. Okay, so um, that's A DA. 
Okay, and by ADA here, I will mean really um, for those of you who are familiar with um, differential geometry, um, a wedge DA. And of course, this is the same as epsilon mu nu lambda, a mu d nu a lambda. But I'm just gonna I'm just gonna use um, the shorthand notation um, a da. Okay. Um, if if it's not clear at any point, just let me know, and I'll I'll I'll, exp I'll expand. Now, um, I can turn this constant of proportionality in, into an equality. Um, and the equality is what we call the churn simons level number divided by 4 pi. But this guy is actually quite important in this story. So this is the level, uh, uh, level number. Okay. And for this term, when we add it to the quantum field theory to be gauge invariant, I require that this level number be an integer. Okay. Um, related to the churn simons term is another type of coupling that I can add to this um, story, which is called the BF coupling. And the BF coupling looks like this. Um, it's quite similar to the churn simons coupling in that I have a similar kind of A wedge DA kind of story, except I've got two fields at play here. Uh, let's call them A and B. And these two fields A and B um, will go like one over two pi integral, um, again, in three dimensions, A wedge, but I'm using the same shorthand notation, so ADB. And by doing an integration by parts, um, you can show that this is the same as SBF of BA. So the integration by parts nets you a minus sign and then um, the wedge product nets you another minus sign so that the sign is the same. But um, in addition to this, there are some boundary terms that you would need to worry about which comes from the integration by parts. Um, of course, you know, we're going to circumvent this and not um, consider manifolds of boundary. And so <clears throat> um, the boundary term necessarily vanishes and SPF of AB is the same as F, uh, SPF of um, BA. So this term actually plays an important role in the, in the four dimensional story where I need a contribution that plays the role of the churn simons term. And this contribution comes from a BF type term, which in four dimensions is, is called a, a, a theta coupling in four dimensional gauge theory. So we're nearly there with all of the, um, all of the notation and conventions that we need. Um, there's one more point that I need to say, and this is probably the most important point here, because I need to tell you what I'm going to mean by uh, duality. So a duality between two theories, let's say A and B, um, is, uh, is a really difficult concept to, to um, establish in general. But in our case, the duality is going, to be, um, is going to be a very special case of the duality. It's going to be a duality in the infrared um, and I'm going to say that two theories, A and B, are dual to each other in the infrared or low energy limits um, if their partition functions are the same. So that's the statement. So uh, in fact, let, let me change this to infrared duality. So this is an IR duality or low energy duality. And two theories A and B are dual to each other if their partition functions ZA and ZB are dual to each other in whatever it takes to establish this low energy limit. So is this, um, is this clear? I think so. Is everybody happy with that? Okay. So in general, establishing 
when two partition functions are equal to each other is a non-trivial task. Fortunately for us, um, Burgess and Quevedo um, established an algorithm um, by which I can tell whether two theories are dual to each other. So this burgess quevedo algorithm, um, so this is Cliff Burgess and Fernando Quevedo. Um, duality algorithm. is a kind of a well-defined set of things that you need to do to establish whether two things are dual to each other. So I start off with theory A. And then I identify an internal symmetry of the theory. And then I gauge that symmetry. So I take that global symmetry and I convert it into a local symmetry. And I do this by introducing some dynamical gauge field. Let's call it little a. And because it's a dynamical gauge field, when I write down the path integral, I have to actually take the functional integral over A. So step one is gauge um, a global symmetry of theory A. That's really just a parenthetical statement. Um, and you do this by introducing a dynamical gauge field. And let's call it A equals A mu PX mu. Um, and I need to point out, or you need to keep in mind that we have to include this a when we do the, um, uh, the functional integral. The second thing is when I introduce this, this new gauge field, I have to make sure that I'm not introducing new gauge degrees of freedom. I have to make sure that I'm not introducing new degrees of freedom into my theory A. So to do that, I need to make sure that this gauge field A is a pure gauge field. In other words, its, um, it's associated curvature or field strength tensor is zero. So I constrain A to be a pure gauge field, pure gauge gauge field. By demanding that F, which is DA, and by the way, um, in the same spirit of my um, denoting external gauge fields by capital letters and dynamical gauge fields by lowercase letters, I'm going to de denote their field strengths in the, same, uh, in the same convention. So I can make sure that A is pure gauge by demanding that its field strength um, equals zero. Um, and the way I do that is, sorry, Um, the way I do that is to um, add a Lagrange multiplier. And let's call the Lagrange multiplier lambda. So I add a Lagrange multiplier type term, which in the action will go like lambda f. And you can see that this lambda f term forces f to be zero if lambda is a Lagrange multiplier. The result of step three is a master action. Let's call it s master. And the master action is a functional of my original fields phi the gauge field that I introduced, A, and the Lagrange multiplier, which I'm going to think of as a field in the theory, okay? So if you remember what I said the last time, for those of you who were here the last time, duality works like this. I have some master field, some master action, 
master partition function, master path integral if you want. And if I integrate out one set of fields, in this case, if I integrate out the Lagrange multiplier, I set f uh, dA equal to zero, I'll result in the original theory that I started off with, in this case, theory A. If I, on the other hand, exchange the order of integration and, and integrate out the gauge field, little a, then I'm left with the dual theory, um, uh, which we would call theory B in the set, in the setting. So step four then is if I integrate out um, first lambda, and then a, I'm left with the action for theory A, which was just a functional of phi that we started off with. On the other hand, if I exchange the order of integration and integrate out A, um, and then phi, I'm left with a dual action, which I'm gonna call theory B, and the dynamical variable in theory B is lambda. So that's it. So if I give you, if I start off with some um, action SA and I ask you to dualize this action, then this is how you go about doing it. These four steps will get you a dual um, action when you can do it. So the when you can do it is of course all the details here. And the question is when can you carry out these functional integrals and all of the nuances that come with doing functional integration. Um, and when, when we can carry this um, out, so when steps one to four are possible, we will say that the two theories, S A of phi and S B of lambda are dual to each other, okay? So T-duality, bosonization, um, uh, I'm trying to think what else I, I, I gave you as an example the last time, um, electric magnetic duality, they're all in the same class of dualities that I can do exactly this with to get from the one theory to the dual theory. And because electromagnetic duality is in some sense kind of self-dual, um, I'll find that SP is also a theory of um, electromagnetism. Whereas in bosonization, I start off with a bosonic theory and I end up with a fermionic um, theory. Any questions? This last step is called the Bush's rule, right? The four. Ah, good. So um, in, in T-duality, this is the establishment of the duality between the, 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 the theories. So once, I, once, I, once I've done all of this, right? once I've done all of these four steps, and there's a lot that goes into these four steps, to be clear. But once I've done all of these four steps, then I take theory B, and I look at what I needed to do to the particle content of theory A to get to theory B. So you know, in some cases, in, in the case of T-duality, for example, I take the metric on the one theory, I manipulate that metric by adding some fields and dividing by some things, and I'll get the metric of the other theory. I take the bosons of the one theory, I do some things to them, and I end up with the bosons of the other theory. Okay? Um, in other words, the duality establishes what's going on in the background, but once I've gone, once all of the in-between stuff happens, in other words, step one and step four are the starting point and ending point of this story, once I know what S A of phi is and S B of lambda is, I ask, what did I need to do specifically to the fields in S A of phi to get S B of lambda? Okay, mm -hmm. right. In the context of string theory, that set of things that you needed to do to the particle content of the first theory to get to the particle content of the T dual theory is the Boucher rules. In other words, one way to think about this is the Boucher rules of string theory um, are nothing but a mnemonic for what you need to do um, in theory A to get theory B. Right. Yeah. Okay. That make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Cool. So now I need to tell you about the central um, step in this story, and this is the idea of bosonization. The idea that um, I can do something to a bosonic theory um, so that its collective excitations behave like fermions. And I said that the, the key thing here in bosonization um, is the idea of um, flux attachment. So let me tell you um, what that means at the level of the path integral. So at the level of the path integral, what bosonization amounts to is the statement that the partition function of my fermionic theory, the same. So imagine, um, okay, so this is what I mean here. Um, the partition function of the fermionic theory would be what I get if I integrate out um, psi e to the i s um, of psi s fermion of psi and a. So that s fermion action that I wrote down a little earlier um, in the previous page. Uh, so where was this? So this guy here, yeah. if I take this, exponentiate it e to the i um, uh, s fermion, and then I integrate out um, in the path integral um, over all of the fermions, of course, they're, they're psi and psi bar in here, and technically we think about them as independent variables. So when I do the path integral, I've got to integrate over the psi as well as the psi bars. Um, then I get the partition function for this theory. And you can see having integrated out the fermions, I'm left with just um, uh, a functional of um, a, a functional of the gauge, the external gauge field. Okay, so that's what I mean by Z fermion. And I mean something similar for Z boson. And bosonization at the level of the path integral is a statement that if I take this Z fermion and I multiply it by e to the minus i over two um, s churn simons of a. So you can see on the right-hand side, uh, sorry, on the left-hand side, there's gonna be an equality coming here. So on the left-hand side, I just have a fermionic partition function multiplied by an exponential of the churn simons um, term. So I've coupled, I've coupled the, the, the two in a, in a particular way. And this thing is dual or is equal to at the level of the partition function, a scalar plus a flux. The partition function for a scalar coupled to a flux, um, uh, and this is a functional of a. So this is the this is the statement of bosonization, and it's a important enough statement that let's highlight this thing. So whenever I talk about bosonization and bosonization duality or Bose Fermi duality, this is what I mean. Okay. So let's expand this a little bit and I'll tell you what each of these things are. I've already told you what Z fermion is. Um, Z scalar plus flux. So Z scalar plus flux of A is just the integral over the dynamical gauge field um, and the scalar of the exponential of I scalar. And this was a functional of phi and A plus I churn Simons of little a plus I S B F of little a and capital A. So this term here is the kinetic term for the boson coupled to an external gauge field. This is the kinetic term for the gauge field A. And this I mean, is the coupling. Yeah. I think it's frozen. Yeah, it's frozen again. Yeah. Hey, really? Oh, sorry. Um, so, 
me see. Okay. Um, Can everybody see me though, right? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Okay, I seem to have got kicked out again. Sorry, let me fix this. Okay. Um, so this is a coupling of A and capital A. Right? Because capital A is a is an external gauge field, it doesn't have any dynamics. I don't have to include any dynamical term um, for this. Um, now you may be wondering why I'm not mentioning any uh, any Maxwell term. So note here, um, let's make a note of this. The key point here is that a Maxwell term, Maxwell gauge term that goes like F squared, um, these go like um, F being DA, so this would be something like DA squared, right? This is what you would be familiar with from, from electrodynamics. But the, the key point here is that this term enters like one over four times the gauge field coupling squared, one over four E squared. And the limit that we're interested in is the limit in which E goes to infinity. So the low energy limit in the theory that we're talking about is the limit in which E squared goes to infinity. And consequently, I can drop Maxwell terms relative to chern simons terms. So I will always just in general um, only add the chern simons terms and there will be an understanding between us that, um, that technically what I'm doing is I'm adding a chern simons term plus a Maxwell term and then I'm sending E squared off to infinity and that suppresses the, the Maxwell term. Okay. Um, is everybody happy with everything so far? Yes. Good. Okay. So um, there's something else that I need to mention here, which is that um, I can change the direction of time. I'm free to do that in this in this theory by acting on the theory with the time reversal operator. So the time reversal operator just changes t to minus t. That's it. Okay. Now. This theory is not time reversal invariant. Um, and in fact, acting on the, 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 well, these theories are not time reversal invariant. And if I act on them with the time reversal operator, um, I'll produce another relation. So the time, um, so acting on the duality with the time reversal operator, which I'm gonna call T, um, which sends t to minus t as the effect that it produces a new duality, which is the time reversal vari uh, variant of the duality that, um, that we have. And this is the statement that Z fermion, which again is a functional of A, um, is e to the plus i over two S churn Simons, so A, um, and that's equal to what I'll call the tilde um, scalar plus flux.
And this is defined to be the integral over a integral over phi uh, e to the i s scalar of phi and a minus i s churn simons minus i s bf. So the key things that we've done here is change this sign, this sign, and this sign. And in fact, that's what time reversal um, does to these theories, is that it changes the signs of the churn simons terms. Okay, This is very important for, for what follows, because what we're going to see is that acting with bosonization duality twice, but not bosonization, bosonization, more bosonization, time reversal, bos uh, time reversed bosonization, um, actually implements some of this duality web. Okay, um, so this is the bosonic version of um, the. This is the bosonic, the Bose Fermi leg of the uh, of the duality web. Okay, I mentioned this last time, and I'll say it again. The duality web, the full duality web, is a connection of dualities that go Fermi Fermi. Bose, Bose, and Bose Fermi. In other words, starting from one of these theories, I can map to any of the others by implementing various dualities. This is why it's called a duality web. Okay, so we've now just established um, Bosonization or the Bose Fermi version of the boson uh, of the um, of the three D web. The Fermi Fermi version of three D web is even more interesting. Now, this is a map between um, two fermionic theories. And it actually has some um, very cool um, physical interpretation. So the Fermi Fermi version of the duality web um, is related to a conjecture by, uh, by Dam Sun. And Sun's conjecture was a statement about the lowest Landau level um, uh, in, a, in a fractional quantum Hall system. So Sun's conjecture was trying to, Sun made his conjecture in trying to explain the peculiar property of the lowest Landau level of, of um, the fractional quantum Hall system. So basically the story is the following. If I take some electrons and I let them move on a plane in the presence of a magnetic field, then very famously, this was a problem that was studied by Lev Landau way back um, in the early 20th century. Um, and Landau showed that um, the energy levels of this system exhibit a very particular structure. This level structure to the, to the energy levels of the electron uh, moving on this plane um, is what's called the Landau levels. Now, um, the lowest Landau level, which I can force the electron into by cranking up the magnetic field, um, the lowest Landau level is particularly interesting, right? And it's, it's received a, an enormous amount of um, study in the, in the, in the, over the years. The literature on the subject is quite, quite substantial. And in fact, um, a significant amount of um, Rue's PhD work is focused on the lowest Landau level um, of various kind of electron gases in, in various geometries. Now, um, the, the, the story with this Landau level structure is that, um, is that the lowest Landau level exhibits a particular symmetry called particle hole symmetry. Essentially, um, if you remember the way um, Dirac thought about um, uh, uh, these states of, a, um, of an electron, um, you would know that um, he thought of a sea of electrons that were either occupied or not occupied. Um, and when they weren't occupied, um, then you, you would get holes and the particles and the holes both behave like particles. So this was the particle hole picture. Now, the lowest Landau level of the system um, exhibits a particle hole symmetry, but the full system itself does not exhibit a particle hole symmetry. So um, someone and a bunch of other people were trying to understand 
of why it is that the lowest Landau level exhibits um, uh, manifests this particle hole symmetry, but it's not there in the full system. And it came down to, to thinking of the electrons um, in, that are moving in, in this picture as composite fermions. And Sun's conjecture is really a statement that the composite fermion is really a Dirac fermion. Um, so Sun's conjecture is that a composite fermion in the fractional quantum hole system is a Dirac fermion. Okay. Um, specifically, this statement translates into the statement that a um, Dirac massless Dirac fermion Um, coupled to a uh, U1 external gauge field is dual to a, uh, in fact, let's, let's, um, call this fermion psi. And this thing is dual to a composite fermion, let's call it chi, coupled to a dynamical gauge field, little a, um, with A and the external gauge field from here, which I'll call A, coupled. I'll make this precise just now. But, but here we have two different theories that are dual to each other. This was Sun's conjecture, essentially. And on the one side, I have um, a massless Dirac fermion, psi, coupled to some gauge field, external gauge field, like if I turn on a magnetic field, like in the fractional quantum Hall effect. And on the other side, I have a composite fermion chi um, that's coupled to uh, an external fluctuating gauge field, little a, and little a is also coupled to the external gauge field, capital A. Okay. So explicitly, this is the statement that um, the partition function for um, the Fermion coupled to A, this is theory A, which is just an, a, um, this is just uh, Z fermion A. This thing is equal to the partition function for three dimensional QED coupled to an external gauge field. So three dimensional QED quantum electrodynamics is a fermion coupled to, or this is, so we're talking with, uh, with QED with one fermion uh, flavor. So this is uh, ZQED um, coupled, so a fermion coupled to a dynamical gauge field. And that dynamical gauge field is coupled to the external gauge field. So that's why ZQED is also a functional of um, capital A. Is this, uh, is this clear? Uh, okay, I hear that. Uh, I'm just um, wondering, what do you mean by the composite fermion? So in this case, it's just a fermion. It's just a Dirac fermion. So a composite fermion is a fermion that's made up of, so if you want to think about, um, uh, um, okay. So we're, we're kind of used to thinking about composite bosons, at least in the context of superfluids, for example. Um, 
superfluid is a gas of, of electrons under certain conditions where the electrons start to pair up and that yeah. pair of electrons, the Cooper pair of electrons um, behave collectively like a boson. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So in this context, and it's a little bit weirder to think about it because of the, the spin statistics theorem, but here I have a fermion and the statement is that this fermion behaves like fermion because of collective excitations, right? So in this sense, it's, it's a composite fermion, but the statement that Son was making in his conjecture is that the composite fermion is a, is a Dirac fermion. Uh, okay. Right, so it's a Dirac fermion under certain conditions behaves like this composite fermion, um, uh, specifically something that lives in the lowest lambda level. Okay. In fractional quantum model. Okay, so just to be explicit here, this integral is the integral of a psi and A um, of the exponential I S fermion um, plus I over two S BF. S fermion is a functional of chi and A and SPF is a functional of little a and capital A, right? So here's the really cool thing. The really amazing thing here is that this duality, so this is, this is an important statement and it's a really non-trivial statement actually, um, that these two theories are dual to each other, right? So there's the second duality. This is the Fermi-Fermi duality. On both sides of the theory, I have fermionic, uh, both sides of the duality, I have fermionic theories. And you know you should contrast this with what was going on here, where on the one side of the duality I had a fermionic theory, and the other side I had a bosonic theory. So that was bosonization. I take a bosonic theory, and I sorry, I take a fermionic theory, and I bosonize the theory. I use the word bosonize as a verb. Um, and in this case, I have a fermionic theory, and I I'm dual to another fermionic theory, right? And that other fermionic theory just happens to be quantum electrodynamics in three dimensions. So the really amazing thing about this is that we can derive this Fermi-Fermi duality directly from bosonization. So I can think of bosonization in some sense as a seed from which all of these other dualities are, uh, is, are going to follow. And it, that story goes like this. Um, so let's get this. So to derive um, the Fermi, Fermi duality. Um, from Brosenization. We do the following. We start off um, from the Brosenization relation. So start from Brosenization. And just to make my life easier, I'm going to call, I'm going to label these. Um, so let's label this guy equation two. And I'm going to label this one equation one. Okay, so equation one is going to refer to this path into this partition function equality for bosonization. Equation two is going to label the partition function equation um, for um, the Fermi Fermi relation. So I start from equation one. Um, and then what I do is I promote the external gauge field to a dynamical gauge field. So I give it dynamics. So I promote A to a dynamical gauge field, which I'm going to call um, little a, and then I'm going to couple little a to an external gauge field. And just to make things confusing, I'm going to call the external gauge field because I'm always going to call external gauge fields unless I have more than one um, of them around. I'm going to call it capital A as well. Okay, so sorry about that, but it is what it is. Um, so I'm going to promote capital A to little a and couple little a to a new external gauge field which I'm going to call A. Okay so let me just let's just go back here and look at this. So here I had 
an equality between partition functions and both, both sides of the duality, the partition functions were functionals of an external gauge field A. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this little A and I'm gonna give it some dynamics, which involves adding some kinetic terms to this story and promote it to a dynamical gauge field, little a. And then I'm gonna turn on another background field, which I'm going to call A again, okay? So that's, um, that's step one. This results in the following. On the left-hand side of equation one, I get the following. Um, the left-hand side of equation one just becomes Z, Q, E, D, three. Okay. So again, in other words, equation, uh, the right-hand side of equation two. So you can see if I promote the external gauge field to, to a dynamical gauge field, then what I need to do is carry out the integral of a little a in the partition function uh, in the path integral, which I do here. And then I'm giving some boundary term, I'm giving some, some um, dynamical term to, to A, um, uh, which is contained in, in, in here. Um, sorry, there should be an S, there should be a plus I S John Simons here. Yeah. Um, and I couple it to an external gauge field um, through a BF type coupling like this. And I get S uh, Z, QED3. Okay, so the left-hand side is particularly straightforward. We get the right-hand side of the Fermi-Fermi relation. The right-hand side of one basically looks like this. Um, becomes, let's call it Z scalar plus flux of A. And this is equal to integral over phi, integral over A, the newly promoted capital A. And then I originally had um, a dynamical gauge field, which I need to call something else. So let's call this guy um, A tilde. And all of this is multiplying an exponential. And the exponential is um, the scalar term the uh, kinetic term, and this was a function of a and, uh, sorry, phi and a tilde. Um, a churn simons term of a tilde, that came from the original um, partition function that we had. Then a coupling between the original partition function and, sorry, the original gauge, dynamical gauge field a tilde and the external, the original external gauge field, which is now a dynamical field. Then the coupling between the original external field and the new external field. And then finally, some dynamics for uh, the newly promoted dynamical field, um, square bracket, okay? So this is a little bit confusing, but um, it, it all makes, it's all just, it's all logically consistent and you can, you can follow the argument as we, as we go along. So that's step two. So again, step one results in a left-hand side um, of the bose fermi duality. That's basically the, the partition function for QED3. And the right-hand side becomes this new um, object here, right? And in this new uh, path integral, I'm integrating out over um, the original dynamical field, the new dynamical field, and then of course there's the um, there's the scalar field, and these are just basically things that we can integrate over. Okay, now step three in the story. Um, and I see that I'm 
seven minutes past time. So I don't, I don't, I'm just going to stop at the end of this. Um, I'm going to stop in, at this derivation of the Fermi Fermi duality, and then we'll take it and that, and then I'll explain how you get the bosonic duality, and that'll be it for, for this. And then um, that would leave me with one more talk uh, in which I'll talk about the, the four dimensional duality. So for today, I'm just going to um, finish this, this part and then we'll stop here. So what do we do? So now we, step three is integrate out. the dynamical gauge field um, A. So the question is, how do, I, how do I carry out this path integral? And you know, for those of you who were in my, um, in my string theory class last year, uh, where we did a bunch of path integration, you'll know that you know, even the harmonic oscillator is a pain in the butt to, to path integrate. So what do we do? Well, it turns out that because the gauge field A, little a, occurs quadratically in the action, the way we integrate it out is actually by using its equations of motion. So I go back to the action for the, the full action for um, all my fields. I write down, I work that by variation of the action, I work out um, the Euler-Lagrange equations. And in this case, it will give me um, the equations of motion for A. And the equation of motion for A basically reads that dA, um, which you will recall is just F, is d capital A, which is capital F, plus two d A tilde. Okay, so that's the equation of motion for um, little a. And you know you might say, okay, well I can just do minus d of a plus two a tilde, and you wouldn't be wrong. And then you could say, well, okay, um, this just means that a is minus uh, a plus two a tilde. And you sort of would be, would be correct here as well. And this comes down to the idea of, um, of uh, homology. Um, because I've got D of something and it's equal to D of something else, it's not necessarily true that the something and the something else are automatically equal. They're only equal to each other if there's no non-trivial um, topology lurking in the background. So let's assume that there's no non-trivial topology lurking in the background, in which case, um, in order to carry out the path integral over A, all I have to do is everywhere I see a little a, I just substitute a minus capital A minus 2A tilde, in which case I get um, the following from, from here. I'll find that e to the minus i over 2 times the chern simons term for capital A, the external gauge field, is equal to, keeping in mind I've now integrated out little a, integral d phi, integral d a tilde, exponential of i S scalar of phi a tilde minus i s trans Simons of a tilde minus i s bf of a tilde and a. And then I stare at this thing not too long because it's not too difficult to see. And I'll find that this guy here is nothing but e to the plus i s chern Simons of a times z fermion of a. Why? Because that's nothing but the time reversed version of the bosonization duality. So again, I started with bosonization, I did all of these things, and I end up in the final step where I use the bosonization reality uh, duality again, but in its time reversed form to write this down and you'll see that this cancels with this. And so the right hand side is nothing but Z fermion of A. In other words, we've used bosonization twice 
once in its original form and once in its time reversed form to derive the Fermi Fermi duality. Okay, so that's the that's the Fermi Fermi duality, which we've derived by two applications of the Bose Bose of the Bose Fermi duality, and that leaves just one more leg of the of the duality web called the boson boson duality, which works. You can believe me, and I, otherwise I'm happy to do this again um, uh, in the next uh, talk. Um, but it works in exactly the same way. You promote. You start off with bosonization. You promote um, the external gauge field to a dynamical gauge field. You integrate out um, one of the fields, and you'll find that on the left-hand side, you end up with um, a Z scalar. And on the right-hand side, you'll end up with um, something we call scalar QED, or the abelian Higgs model for anybody who's worked in this, in this area before. And that's basically um, the, the duality map. So the point is that I can start off with any one of these theories and apply a sequence of dualities and get to any of these other theories. Practically speaking, even though I can start with any one of the theories as a seed, the, the, the easiest seed to grow is bosonization. So the next time around, I'm going to, I'm going to start and generalize three-dimensional bosonization to four dimensions and show you what some of the subtleties are in there, um, and then use four-dimensional bosonization in the same way to seed um, four-dimensional Fermi-Fermi and four-dimensional Bose-Bose um, duals. Okay, any questions? Um, perhaps this is silly, but uh, what, I mean, what, what's the point of showing that uh, we have Fermi-Fermi duality? I mean, that sounds like a, a trivial statement. But that, I mean, obviously we have to do this whole process to show it. So what are we actually showing? Um, you're actually showing that two different fermionic theories are essentially the same theory. They contain the same, the same information, the same degrees of freedom, just organized in different ways. But they're different theories. They're different theories altogether. Cool. Thank you. Yep. And in, in, a, in a sense, okay, so that's the, you know, that's the mathematical... Um, relation. The, the, the physics underpinning this is exactly the physics of the lowest Landau level and the fractional quantum Hall effect. So this, this, this statement is a very deep statement that goes to unpacking the physics of the quantum Hall effect. Okay, so now, so this is, um, so you say you can start with any of the theories and then move by applying the, the dualities. But the, the, base, the, the most, the, the, the most use, easy one to do is to start from the bosonization first. Yes. Okay, then you can move to the fermion, the fermionic theory, and then you That's can right. move from it or not. That's right. And then you form a kind of loop. Uh, yes, uh, you, you form a kind of loop. Um, uh, in fact, you know, by, by, by repeatedly adding different fluxes to the story, I can generate an infinite number of such dualities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, no, thanks. Cool. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. uh, 